Hi, welcome to Bewilder Beats. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and today we are going to talk about an exploding whale incident and a cat who solved a murder. Ready? Let's go. We will be discussing that famous exploding whale incident of 1970 and why that whale fail lives on in infamy. So big thanks to author and columnist Dave Barry, who wrote about this whale incident in 1990, where I was able to find it, read it, and never forget it. His humor is absolutely a cornerstone of this podcast and honestly most of my writing, and I am ever grateful for stumbling upon that article as a nine-year-old girl. But first... Have you heard of a cat who solved a murder? In 1996, when Shirley Duguay was found murdered on Prince Edward Island, Canadian Mounted Police immediately suspected her husband, Douglas Beamish. But there was no evidence to tie him to the crime. All that was found by Shirley was a bloody jacket covered in Shirley's blood and it had a bunch of white hair on it. Cat hair. Now, Douglas Beamish had a criminal record, which does not necessarily mean he committed you know, murder. But the Mounties recalled something from an earlier visit with Beamish. His parents had a white cat named Snowball. So they had an idea. Forensics has come a long way since the 1990s. At this time, no one in Canada had the technology for a live animal witness. So the Mounties reached out to the United States, who thought that they might be able to extract and test the DNA from the cat hairs. To make absolutely certain, the RCMP sent samples from 20 other cats from the island to the lab in the United States to make sure that only this one cat, Snowball, was the only match. But that she also had such a distinct DNA profile that it could only be Snowball's hair on the jacket, which would link Beamish to the crime. If the other cats had even come close, then this evidence would have been immediately thrown out and Douglas Beamish would have walked free. But thanks to this cat, Douglas Beamish was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Shirley Duguay. And while Snowball was the first animal to be used as DNA evidence in a criminal case, she wasn't the last. Snowball was the perfect witness. November 12, 1970. It was over a week after a 45-foot sperm whale beached itself and died. 45 feet is about four and a half basketball nets, hoops, things, whatever, basketball posty things with the backboard and the net, the whole shebang lying top to bottom. This whale also weighed eight tons, which is 16,000 pounds. Now, typically when whales die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and animals eat, digest, and use the nutrients from that carcass, which is great. This is some circle of life stuff. But the other benefit of an at-sea burial? thousand pounds of rotting whale dying on the ocean floor doesn't smell on land. 16,000 pounds of dead whale on a sunny beach does smell. It smells so bad. And this is where things take an interesting turn. I mean, in the context of this story, it was the 1970s, so I'm sure it made sense at the time. But for starters, the person tasked with whale removal was George Thornton, a dead whale removal specialist. Oh, Wait, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. He was the assistant district highway engineer of the Oregon State Highway Department. That makes sense, right? State highway engineers are totally the right professional for Cetacea coroners. Or not. Why would the highway department have this monumental task? I mean, yes, there were nearby roads that were affected by slower traffic by rubbernecking individuals looking to see the decomposing whale on the beach, but beaches were actually part of the jurisdiction of the highway department at the time. For reasons that will become abundantly clear, this is no longer the case. So poor George, whose boss was out hunting that day, was tapped for the job. After a week of increasingly bad smell, gases inflating the carcass, traffic nightmares, though to me, 
The real nightmare would be the windows in a wooden station wagon, all the way up, or worse, all the way down, for an extended amount of time waiting for the other drivers to hurry up. This is not the place I'd want to be stuck behind someone driving slow, especially without air conditioning. George and the highway department had some ideas. They floated the idea of burying the whale in a burial next to sea. But there was a risk that the whole tide would unbury the whale, which would create a whole new problem. Perhaps they could just chop up the whale, but after a week of decomposition, no one was willing to do that job. Understandably. How about setting fire to the carcass? A giant, wet, decomposing whale wasn't going to burn very easily, plus that smell and the smoke after a week of decomp? Ugh. The idea was dead on arrival. So George, a practical man, thought how he would handle this problem if instead of a whale that there was a boulder in the way on a highway. You make a big problem into little problems, manageable problems, by blowing them up. Besides, there are cases of whales blowing up naturally. After they die on beaches, gases build up in the dead whale, which in some cases does create an explosion. And if the whale blows up, digestible chunks can be picked up by birds, which would get rid of the problem much faster and in an environmentally friendly way. So what if George just sped up the process? After consulting with the United States Navy, they decided to use TNT, dynamite, to blow up the whale. So how much dynamite does it take to blow up an eight-ton whale? Military veteran Walt Umenhofer happened to have a military background in explosives training. He had purchased a new car in a neighboring town a few days prior at a, and I'm not making this up, get a whale of a deal promotion at an Oldsmobile dealership in the next town. He drove his brand new car to the area to see the whale go boom, and what he saw had him very concerned. He went down to the beach and pleaded his case, suggesting that 20 sticks of dynamite would absolutely do the trick, at least enough explosive to send the whale out to sea. Well, if 20 sticks would do it, then 20 cases of TNT would absolutely take care of business, right? Despite warning against this plan, 20 cases it was, a half a ton of dynamite was put under the whale and bystanders started to roll in like they were going to watch a dance off. You see, they didn't have TikTok or cable, so their entertainment for the whole week was going to watch this whale go boom. Problem solved. Mission accomplished. But it wasn't mission accomplished. Things were about to go very, very hilariously wrong for the seaside town of Florence, Oregon. At 3.30 p.m., with a news crew reporting on site with a giant decomposing whale behind them in the footage that you can watch today on YouTube, the dynamite was placed and the people were asked to move a quarter of a mile away, you know, for safety. At 3.45 p.m., the TNT was finally detonated. What they were expecting was the whale to just disintegrate, hopefully taking the smell with it. But what happened? Chunks of exploded whale blubber shot straight into the sky and flew over 800 feet. How far is 800 feet? Well, that's one and a half times the size of the Washington Monument, two-thirds the height of the Empire State Building, and the length of two American football fields. Straight into the sky and down the street and into the town. Reporter Paul Lindman said of that day, the land blubber newsman became land blubber newsman for the blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. One giant piece of exploded, rotting whale chunk crushed Walt Umenhofer's brand new car. All right, kids, that's what we call Chekhov's car. An expensive car mentioned in the first act is absolutely going to be important in the third. Remember, Walt Umenhofer was the explosives expert who happened to be driving down to see the event and warned against what would happen with that amount of dynamite. He ended up with probably the weirdest insurance claim in history. Insurance company. Did you say a hole in your car? A hole on your car? A whale? How did a whale get on your car? A flying piece of blubber the size of a small truck tire crushed the entire passenger side of his brand new car. Reporter Paul Lindman said in his book, Explosions in the movies usually look like a blast of fire and smoke. This one more resembled a mighty burst of tomato juice. And on that YouTube footage, you will hear the people on the beach. 
They start with a cheer of excitement, and then it suddenly turns to despair and disgust and the sultry sounds of whale pieces thudding into the ground, into buildings, thumping into cars, the road, and my favorite. There's a woman saying, Okay, Fred, you can take your hands out of your ears now. Here comes pieces of... And the sound cuts out. In defense of Walt Umenhofer's experience suggesting only 20 sticks, he also suggested that he would need a lot more than 20 cases if the objective was to disintegrate the 8-ton sea beast, and he was unclear how much but that a lot more would have to be exploded than what they had. And in defense of poor George Thornton, the man who was tapped to take care of the stinking whale of a problem, this really wasn't something that he ever could have planned for. In the 90s, he was re-interviewed by reporter Paul Lindman again, and George pointed to the media for blowing this out of proportion and suggesting, contrary to all evidence, nothing went wrong. I don't think it was the media blowing anything out of proportion. I think it was the DNT that might have done most of the blowing. Blew that whale right over 800 feet from the beach. So why did this go so epically wrong? When the 20 cases of dynamite were put under the whale and detonated, the weight of the whale was too great and the bulk of the explosion went down into the sand instead of up into the guts and meat of the whale. And as a result, only some of the whale was effectively disintegrated as planned. Most of it remained on the beach for the Oregon Highway Division workers to clear away and with bulldozers bury the whale on the beach which was the first plan that they didn't want to do, but it would have saved them a lot of time, effort, and at least one Oldsmobile, and a lot of emergency showers that day from the townsfolk. And remember, the plan was to break the whale apart so the birds and seagulls and other scavengers and crabs would just eat the remains, right? Yeah, that didn't happen. The birds never came. It's likely that they were scared away by the massive explosion and the chaos that ensued. There is an epilogue. So what do you do if your town explodes a whale in spectacular fashion? Well, if you are Florence, Oregon, you lean in. You wait 50 years and make a memorial park. But if you're really owning history, you name it. Exploding Whale Memorial Park. Yep, they leaned into that whale fail hard. The community chose the name of the park, which is my second favorite community naming convention after the Bodie McBoat face incident. They even had a mascot, a human in a whale suit greeting visitors. Reporter Paul Linneman finished his story back in the 70s. He said it might be concluded that should a whale ever be washed ashore in Lane County again, those in charge would not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. Nine years after the great whale that went boom, 41 sperm whales beached. State park officials, not the highway division, immediately burned and buried them on the beach. Some lessons you just have to learn by making really big mistakes, explosive mistakes, flying whale chunk size mistakes. The important thing is that when you make a whale of a mistake, that you learn and you do better next time. When 15-year-old Solomon ran away, no one expected him to get very far, but he was gone for 74 days worrying his family sick. But his family and the expectations were right. Solomon is a 15-year-old African sulcata tortoise who is found about an eighth of a mile from home. That's half a lap of a track in track and field, or literally a two-minute walk for most able-bodied adults strolling to Starbucks. So while his journey took him two months to make, it took just a couple of minutes for a man and his son who were driving by and saw Solomon grazing at a construction site to swipe him up and carry him back to the family. Thanks for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on this podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and at bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Wikipedia on the exploding whale, Newsweek.com, MentalFloss.com, OregonLive.com, Offbeat Oregon, HuffPost, Wikipedia on the murder of Shirley Duguay, 
The New York Times, Animals at HowStuffWorks.com, HuffPost on the Runaway Tortoise, and of course, The Washington Post with an article called Thar She Blows by Dave Barry from May 20th, 1990. Links are available in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz and interstitial music is by MK2. Taps is played by Andrew Dale. Huge thanks to columnist Dave Barry. And don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.